Welcome to the Consummate Athlete Podcast, where our goal is to help you find health and community through movement. I'm Molly Herford, a writer, coach, and yoga teacher. And I'm Peter Glassford, an endurance coach and kinesiologist. Every week, we're talking to athletes and experts who can help you lead your best active, adventurous life. Whether you're a gravel racer, a marathon runner, or you just got out on your first bike ride yesterday, we're here cheering you on. You can also visit us online at consummateathlete.com for coaching information and training tips, nutrition advice, yoga flows, bike skills, and more. And now, let's get into this week's episode. The question we have this week is how to move during injury, specifically a broken wrist. So a cyclist with a broken wrist. Uh, this is like a pretty common thing. A cyclist with some kind of upper body collarbone is a super common one for cyclists. Yeah, exactly. And so we were quite, you know, what do we call this episode, you know, as far as search terms and, you know, the most useful question. So it is, you know, this is the thumb is a big one. The wrist is a big one, uh, you know any part of your arm so upper arm lower arm actually when i was doing the hundred miler the the one guy with me had uh recently dislocated his pinky on a run he crashed and dislocated his pinky and i've never seen this before he tripped over a rock and i swear he tucked rolled did like two somersaults and like bounced back up with like his pinky in the air and it was the funniest damn thing i've ever right, seen right yeah and then probably his back strained or something yeah, yeah, but... the next day or something yeah <laughs> Yeah. And so it's, it's one of these things that, you know, the first question is always like, well, how do I ride the trainer, you know, with this arm, right? So you'll see people do all sorts of goofy things with, you know, stability balls on their handlebar and Glassford is uh, speaking from experience. Yeah. And here. so I have this solution where you use a band. Uh, I think we've posted it. So I'll, I'll put a link to it. Now we use this with a caution and we'll talk about the cautions in a second, but you basically take this big stretch band, which, you know, a fat bike tube or two fat bike tubes sort of fastened to the door or the wall behind you. Like if you're in a garage with like a big hook off the wall behind you, you need to figure out a way to fasten it to the wall above and behind you is the ideal. And then you sort of loop it around yourself and people have created better harnesses than this, but I just sort of like a, you would a purse. So over one shoulder and under the other arm. Uh, and then often you'll alternate it, you know, sort of move it around during the session because it gets sort of annoying. But this, what this does basically is it, it's sort of holding you in that cycling position without having to put too much pressure on your arms. Sounds like a sexy good time. Yeah. And, and so the, the what we're trying to avoid with that is stressing the other arm or sitting crooked on the bike or, you know, stressing the injured arm or, or the like sitting upright and pedaling, you know, just sort of lo loafing along. Right. Sitting so upright. you can do this while having the other hand like on the handlebar and more in the traditional cycling position versus what most people would do is, oh, I can get back on the trainer and they just sit straight up and are just pedaling pretty ineffectively. Yeah, because they can't handle it right on the, the load on the arm or, you know, they're putting all their load on one arm and they're sitting crooked to like, you know, as you would, right? You have to sort of bias to one side. So now your hips are sitting weird on the saddle and then there's stresses all through the body, right? Like everything's a trade off. So I found that that band, if you have to train on the trainer, uh, that setup is decent right and so we've used this i've seen different people use it to get you know they're maybe doing the olympics or they're doing uh you know national championships are coming up quick uh and, and they've decided that it's worth the the risk of training while they're healing a bone which i think is is probably central to this and these are the caveats yeah yeah i think that's probably the the most important thing is coming back to what we always say which is the the what's your why so why are you trying to get back to training as quickly as possible is there actually a reason or is it just because you're you know you're you're nervous that you're going to lose your fitness or or whatever right, right and so we look at you know when is the goal and and is it worth it right like to get back to that goal uh, i recall breaking my collarbone uh many years ago and nationals were maybe five or six which is pretty much right on the border of a you know when you don't get surgery for how quickly a collarbone can get you know even close to being able uh so yeah, it was tough. And in hindsight, I don't know. I should have just not done it, right? I should have just, you know, maybe trained a couple times a week just to maintain. And we know from early in the pandemic, again, I'll try and find some of these posts and, and not get too down in the dumps with pandemic stuff. But the some of the good research that came out and questions that got asked early in the pandemic was, well, how do we maintain fitness? How much do we need to do if we can't access our training environment? You know, you couldn't get to the gym, you couldn't get to the pool, uh, you couldn't train outside for a while, right? So how much does it take to maintain? And it doesn't, you can actually really mitigate losses with not a lot of training volume. It's hard to build. It takes some time to build fitness, but maintaining, and this is the tough things for athletes sometimes is, you know, you do all these endurance rides. It doesn't really take much to maintain, especially endurance. 
uh, so, so we can maintain this, right? So then if we have a broken bone, the advantage then is that we can put our energy and time into healing. We can decrease risk and maybe only ride or exercise, you know, a few times a week and really mitigate some of those losses. Right, right. And I mean, I think the the problem with the broken bone is you might not feel the same level of fatigue that you would if you were, say, recovering, like after a, a big event or even after like an illness, you might still be feeling pretty fresh and like feeling pretty. You could. I mean, I would imagine you're in some discomfort for a while. And then I don't know. I think sometimes we, we don't recognize the fatigue, but definitely there's an energy requirement uh, as far as, as, you know, your intake for well, I sure. Think that, that's what I mean is you're, you might just not recognize the fatigue. Not that it's mm-hmm. not there. Yeah. A lot of times you'll see cautions too, right? People will try and really go, you know, because their energy output has decreased, they then look at, you know, trying to really diet hard or really restrict their diet. And then again, they're missing things like the micronutrients, the protein, all the, you know, all this energy that's required for the body to make new bone and, and repair itself. Right. Mm-hmm. So there is a, a, a fine line there. Right. So where we may might spend time is you could go to a, a registered dietitian and get some help with how much should I be eating? What should I be eating? Maybe some new recipes, spend some time cooking learning you know how to fuel your your training and that would be a good investment of time while you're maybe not training quite as much yes and you know me from the organizational side i'll also say maybe it's a good time to look at the other things you know doing your bike maintenance do going through your your gear closet getting rid of some of the old stuff that is no longer serving you just making sure that everything is actually in great shape i mean uh, you know, if you think about just making sure your bike is perfectly tuned up, uh, crappy shifting can be much more problematic than losing three or four watts because you, you've you dropped down a little bit in your fitness. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And it, it's not uncommon to have bikes that are very working very poorly and then people, you know, grinding away on them or, you know, you know, losing races. Like some of this stuff is pretty important, if not uh, taking energy. So, yeah, you know, you're thinking about the the equipment can we get back you know nutrition can we spend time on that we've talked about you know the mental performance you know maybe you could do cons- consultation and talk through some of these stresses and anxiety you have uh around not training or missing competitions or you know maybe goal setting for the long term so that you understand you know no no line or no journey is is a straight line as they say mm-hmm. so yeah we're you know injured now but we're going to build back for cyclocross season and this is you know in the next two months these are your objectives while you're injured and coming back we're not going to rush on you know these races but then these are the you know the initial races you'll do and then this cyclocross race is your great return, right? And sometimes right. that's sometimes that narrative, you know, that readjusting of the course and then saying, but we're still in this two, three, four year timeline, you know, we're still going after your goal, right? And all these experiences are valuable. You're spending time learning about nutrition, the psychology, you know, mental performance, uh, maybe what did you say? Bike maintenance was another one. You said gear organization. And this is, you know, very specific to sport. You could also be spending time with your family, going on vacation. uh, Oh, that's actually a great one. Hustling on work stuff for a little while. You know, there's nothing to say you can't, you know, just take a break too, right? You take a break now in July and and enjoy the sun, go to, you know, a cottage or something too, uh, if that's when this injury happens to occur. No, it's funny. I hadn't really thought about that, but I, I love the idea of, okay, well, if I can, if this is lower, like wh- where do I now have some room in my cup? Can I, yeah, spend time with the kids, get that big work project done. So that way when it is race season, I'm like way ahead on this. Mm-hmm. That's actually, yeah, super, super smart. We see that too with the younger athletes. You know, I never regretted going to university simply like I, I thought it was the greatest time, right? It was pretty structured. There was a lot of workload at times, right? But it was very, looking back it really wasn't that much i mean that's always the way you look back at school right i always say when you're in grade two grade one was easy but then grade three was crushy but then when you look back on grade three from grade four it was fine it really wasn't that big a deal right and no it's funny i i often talk to young athletes who are in university and i say it's i think it's the smartest thing that they can do because it actually forces them to have a time cap on training because the number of like 18 to 22 year old kids who don't go to school in order to like go pro the percentage of them that get burnt out or you know fatigued or end up with a red ass and that kind of stuff i think is significantly higher than the ones who are in university because the ones who are in university have a a set time where they can train and they can compete 
For sure. Having the built in time scale and then just something else to, you know, maybe you're part of a club that's not associated with your sport. And then you're, of course, going to school. Maybe there's some social events. I think it, it works well. Right. And, and as we become adults, that's, you know, as adult athletes, we should have these other components of our life, too. Right. So even though training's not going well, maybe, you know, we're going to the kids for soccer practices or, you know, we're again going on vacation or work. You know, we're spending time on work. Well, and even volunteering for your cycling club if, or like any local cycling for events sure. just to kind of stay in. And I mean, honestly, you get you get serious kudos for volunteering at, uh, at local cycling stuff. So that's kind of a great way to get your volunteer hours in while you can't actually race. So sort of a, a sneaky, selfish way to look at yeah, that. And I think that's, you know, a big part of what we miss. I think if we get down to it, if we're in, you know, really reflecting on what we're missing by not being at the races for some of us, it's definitely that that, you know, urgency of trying to get the result. But I think if we bo- boiled it down, a lot of times it is, you know, being at the event, experiencing the event, seeing the people. So I think, you know, it, it would help. And I think you can actually learn a lot being at events. So even if you don't volunteer, I mean, you should volunteer. I just saw, I think, two or three different uh, event organizers reaching out this week about volunteers. Uh, so I think they're, they're always looking for someone to help. Uh, but even just going, you know, and being able to watch even your race and how it unfolded. Sometimes people have no idea what it's like at the front of their race and they just realize, you know, oh, you know, this person, we talked about standing in the World Cups and it's, again, I don't know exactly what you do, but I think it probably means you need to stand a bit more in your intervals if you want to be at the front of this race was our world championships, but you might realize something completely different, right? Oh, that person messes up all the time, even though they're winning. And I'm back here calling myself a dummy because I fell over, but the person winning the race just fell over and they just didn't call themselves a dummy. (laughs) Sometimes you have to miss the race so you can see that. Yeah. Yeah. Crits in particular, I think are a great one for seeing how, uh, how skills practice for, for roadies, uh, really comes into play because you watch crits and you see you know how some people just sail through the corners and then some people like myself just just slow down and then have to just burn every match trying to Mm -hmm. stay with the pack yeah and you maybe see how the race was won like they went really hard but then they were actually not going hard for you know 10 laps they're just coasting around on their own very you know efficiently once they got away yeah i don't know And, and you may not find anything but i think seeing your races sometimes at least you know breeds a bit of that fire where you're like oh i want to be in there yeah Uh, yeah yeah and i think maybe the the last thing and we've said it probably a million times on this podcast is walking is always great uh you know any most up most upper body stuff uh you can still get out for walks this is a great time to establish that walking habit um i do think that the daily walk is just really the best thing you can do for your your mind and body so and generally that should be well tolerated with most upper body injuries you know there might be a period where they say you know you have to be really careful especially if it's slippery outside or something you know not to fall again yes uh, for sure. some of the shoulder surgeries you know they, you have to be quite careful uh, that you don't because you only get maybe one shot <laughs> at, at repairing this and moving the tissue around uh, but yeah walking's great and i think there's lots of other you know strength training especially with you know a more advanced uh strength coach you know, guided by a physio, uh, including going to physio, uh, therapy, then it's, you know, some of these things can really take up a lot of time where you feel like you're making progress. And you could even see in other parts of your body starting to make progress. Maybe you even have other injuries or weaknesses or asymmetries that you could be working away at, right? That even with a a cast on your full arm, you could be working on maybe your hip mobility with, Mm -hmm. you know, again, a, a strength trainer, a physio or something as well, right? And feel like it's not just this one, one limb that's holding you back. Yeah. Yeah. And I think probably the last thing to add is just, you know, listen, listen to your doctor. Like I'm not saying never get a second opinion or like, don't go, go seek a physio. Definitely, you know, talk to a physio. If you're not sure about what your doctor said, definitely get a second opinion. But generally speaking, your, your doctor who's saying don't ride or exercise for, you know, 46 weeks or whatever, isn't trying to, to screw you out of the state championship or anything like that. Like they're doing it because that's actually what the bone needs to heal. So, you know, just, just taking everything you know, as it comes and it sucks. Um, it really, really does. But trying to, to push back and get back sooner um, is, you know, maybe maybe it works sometimes, but I think more often than not, it just ends up putting you in a deeper hole. Like you say, some of these surgeries and stuff are very uh, twitchy and just, you know, one one slide or one, one shift in the wrong direction, one sneeze while you're on the trainer and mm-hmm. suddenly you've pulled a pin and... 
Yeah, I think that's certainly the message, right? Is, you know, listen to the doctor. But I think also at the same time, talk to the doctor and say, you know, these For are the sure. objectives, these are the things I'm worried about. You know, I, I maybe I'm working with a cycling coach or trying to follow this program towards this race. Like, do you think that this mountain bike race in six weeks, they might say, eh, I don't know about that. And you'll have to reflect on how you deal with that. That's your own personal choice. Uh, but yeah, usually that those first couple weeks are the big ones. And then I, I don't think we're not saying don't jump on the trainer, don't train or you know, some people are even out on the road in a couple of weeks, you know, even training with a cast, right? And then again, this is the judgment decisions we need to make, but probably just being careful, right? And remembering that maintenance doesn't take as many sessions as we might think it does. And then, you know, two weeks sort of really off focused on bone healing is usually sort of what I look at. And then we ease it back up and how quickly you ease it back up again, depends on the injury, how old you are, you know, the, the, uh, the, the stakes i guess really right like is this world championships and olympics or is this you know something that we could probably just skip this year and and put that time span into those two months out you know three months out uh and sometimes that's a better better progression right for sure and obviously as as peter just mentioned uh making sure your coach if you have one is aware of this current situation <laughs> and is adapting your your plan accordingly and if you are someone who doesn't have a coach and you're just kind of confused about how to get their injury like it might actually this might be a great time to reach out to one and even if you're not signing on for like full-on coaching uh just getting some thoughts on how to change shift your current training plan around uh, to work with your specific situation could be a really good, yeah how to good ease thing. back and again go after something in a couple months um mm -hmm. you know what would that look like to to start back in yeah and i think that conversation might even just help you kind of like soothe over the grumpiness of having talked to a doctor who doesn't really care about your cycling goals and just wants your bone to heal like if you can talk to a cycling coach who actually you know cares about both things cares about your bones healing but also understands that your cycling goals are super important to you uh, that can just be s just really helpful even just from a, a mindset standpoint i think just feeling heard and seen there for sure yeah Cool. All right. Well, I think we'll we'll wrap up there. Head over to consummateathlete.com for the show notes and all of the things we, we mentioned in this episode. And like I said, we'll be doing these every Friday. So if you have any questions uh, that you want us to tackle, please hit us up over at consummateathlete.com or at consummateathlete on Instagram. Thanks. And we will see you next week. Thanks so much for tuning into the Consummate Athlete Podcast. If you enjoyed this or any of our past episodes, do us a solid and leave us a rating or review wherever you listen to podcasts. And check out our book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete, over at consummateathlete.com. Questions or comments? Find us over on Instagram, at consummateathlete, and we will see you next week.